You may have heard recently that atmospheric levels of methane seem to be increasing far more rapidly than scientists were predicting. You've probably heard about the rapid warming in the Arctic and the thawing of permafrost that's releasing ancient methane from the land. You may know about the bubbling up of methane hydrates from the shallow waters of the East Siberian ice shelf, caused by the same dramatic increase in Arctic temperatures. In fact, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, you will almost certainly know about these things because we've made several programs on the subject. And of course, we all know about the belching cows in global scale meat production, contributing to the estimated 2 billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent spewed out as methane by all the ruminants on the planet. But what we hear much less about is the methane that's leaking from oil and gas production all over the world. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. Over a 20 year time frame, methane traps 86 times as much heat in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. It's responsible for about a quarter of total atmospheric warming to date. And while the steady increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide are pretty catastrophic, they are at least conforming to scientists' expectations. Methane is not conforming to scientists' expectations. Its levels are rising far faster than they should be. And everyone, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is getting into a bit of a kerfuffle as we try to work out exactly what's going on. Essentially, methane is starting to show itself as the wild card in our ongoing game of chance against our own climate. Back at the start of the Industrial Revolution, our atmosphere contained about 700 molecules of methane for every 1 billion molecules of air, usually expressed as parts per billion, or PPB. As a result of increasing industrialization and burning of coal, oil and gas, Combined with population growth, increases in average levels of income and the corresponding huge expansion of the global meat industry, by the start of this century, those methane levels had gone from 700 parts per billion to 1,775 parts per billion. That's a pretty dramatic increase. But then, at the start of the 21st century, something happened that could very nearly be described as encouraging methane levels actually started to level off, suggesting a correlation with the new digital technology age, which was by then allowing much better analysis and control systems in fossil fuel extraction and in industrial processes, combined with the long overdue commercialization and financial competitiveness of wind and solar, as well as a handful of other renewable technologies. How hopeful we all were in those heady days back at the start of the century. Had a new dawn broken? Had our energy providers finally experienced the epiphany we all so hoped they might? Had Rex Tillerson arranged for solar panels to be fitted on the roof of his $4 million mansion? No. In 2007, this happened. In the 12 years between then and now, methane levels in our atmosphere have increased by as much as they did in the preceding 35 years. So what on earth happened in 2007? Well, one thing that happened was that the price of a barrel of oil nudged the $100 barrier for the first time in history, before sailing straight through that barrier and on up to an all-time high of about $136 a barrel, just before the worst economic meltdown in the history of civilization in 2008. At the same time, as this Guardian report tells us, some other American entrepreneurs, having predicted the impending demise of the oil industry, had figured out how to literally force open rocks that were often more than a mile under the surface of the earth to produce gas and then oil. Most notably among these gold diggers was the infamous Aubrey McClendon, the founder of Chesapeake Energy, who died in a mysterious high-speed head-on car crash into a concrete viaduct just one day after a federal grand jury had indicted him for violating antitrust laws during his time as Chesapeake CEO. Anyway, back to the point. The rocks, called shale, source rock or tight rock, and once thought to be completely impermeable, were opened by combining two technologies. Horizontal drilling, in which the drill bit can travel more than two miles horizontally, and hydraulic fracturing, in which fluid is pumped into the earth at a high enough pressure to crack open hydrocarbon bearing rocks, while a so-called propant, usually sand, 
holds the rocks open a sliver of an inch so that the hydrocarbons can flow. And these technologies brought about what we now slightly glibly call the fracking boom. This chart plots the increase in shale gas production between 1999 and 2019. It was clearly a very small scale industry during the first few years of this century and then suddenly it explodes upwards as we approach the current year. I could swear I saw another chart a bit like that one earlier on. Oh yeah, there it is. Now, you might tell me that this is correlation and not necessarily causation, and that it's the oldest schoolboy error in the scientific book to confuse the two. And you might be right. But this report in the National Geographic from August 2019 points out another interesting correlation. It starts by explaining that previous studies show that shale gas generally has less carbon-13 relative to carbon-12 than methane from conventional natural gas or other fossil fuels like coal. I won't go into the exact difference between carbon-13 and carbon-12 in this video, mainly because I haven't got the slightest clue what those differences are. Suffice to say that they determine the weight of the carbon atom at the centre of the methane molecule. A study authored by Robert Howarth, an ecologist at Cornell University and published in the journal Biogeosciences, took previous data on the chemical composition of methane in the atmosphere and applied a series of equations to see how much of this lighter form of methane could be attributed to shale gas. It turned out that the lighter form of methane released during fracking is a substantial component of the overall methane rise since 2008. Howarth does acknowledge that the chemical fingerprint of shale gas can vary depending on the locale and how the chemical analysis is done. Nevertheless, he does suggest that while the study isn't a smoking gun, it has found a link between rapid methane increases in the atmosphere and the massive rise in shale gas production. It's fuzzy, he says, but the fingerprint is there. So while the dogged and determined climate scientists like Natalia Shakova and Professor Peter Wadhams are quite rightly highlighting the potential risks of a massive methane release from the East Siberian ice shelf, and other campaigners are focusing the spotlight more and more acutely on the truly profligate activities of the global meat industry, these guys have been turning to cutting edge technology to try to establish the true extent of methane leakage, known as fugitive emissions, from the shale gas boom, and in particular, from the fracking industry. There are two major players in this new field, GHGSAT and MethaneSAT, and for all my friends watching in the United States of America, it's methane. <laughs> it just is. MethaneSAT is due for launch in 2022, with the objective of measuring methane emissions from shale plays, which can span thousands of square kilometers. Sophisticated sensors on the satellite will pick up the sun's reflected infrared radiation as it passes through the atmosphere and analyze them to reveal methane's unique fingerprint. A series of intelligent algorithms will sort through the data, factoring in the influence of clouds, tiny particles of air pollution, and reflectivity of the ground cover to calculate even the smallest changes in methane emission rates. And it can measure other sources of human-caused methane emissions too, and it'll make the results publicly available for anyone, free of charge. GHGSAT is slightly ahead of the game, having already launched its demonstration satellite back in 2016. Two further satellites with even more sophisticated equipment on board are due to go operational this year. These commercial satellites are designed to measure individual facilities. To achieve this, the resolution of their imagery is extremely accurate, with each pixel covering an area of less than 50 square meters, compared to the one square kilometer of the methane sat imagery. In practice, it's hoped that the two systems will be complementary rather than competitive. So if methane sat sees a few pixels of high methane content in its wide sweep of the planet, GHGSAT will be able to point its satellites towards that geographic location to determine exactly which facility is leaking methane. Working in conjunction with each other in this way, MethaneSat will be able to tell all the operators in a region what their aggregate emissions are so that their governmental jurisdictions can assess overall performance, while GHGSAT will provide individual operators with direct measurements of emissions from their facilities. 
and GHGSAT are also developing an artificial intelligence package to predict facility level risks of methane emissions using all available data, including the information gleaned from MethaneSAT. Of course, as you might expect me to say, there is also another really good way to avoid these methane fugitive emissions, and that is to stop the extraction of fossil fuels completely and just leave the bloody ground alone. But in the meantime, while we're all impatiently waiting for that day to come, the companies that insist on continuing to operate in this increasingly unjustifiable arena are coming under greater and greater levels of scrutiny, the like of which they could not possibly have dreamt of in their worst nightmares only a couple of decades ago. If I was an oil or gas engineer today, I would be thinking very seriously about getting myself retrained into the renewable energy industry. If I was a lawmaker today, I'd be pushing very hard to enact legislation to subsidise that retraining and prioritise it as a matter of urgency for skilled trades coming out of the fossil fuel industry and into renewables. And if I was the boss of a fossil fuel producer today, I would be instructing my board to immediately halt all further exploration and onward investment in new oil and gas fields and plough that R&D money squarely into getting a foothold in the renewable technology sector. Because even a hard-headed businessman must surely now be able to see that that's where the profits lie as we move deeper and deeper into the 21st century. That's it for this week. Please give us a like and a share if you enjoyed the content of today's programme. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel to show your support for the work we're doing. And of course, if you hit the little bell icon as well, you'll get notified of when the new programmes come out each week. It's completely free and dead easy to do that, of course. All you need to do is click on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.